Welcome to the inaugural Latino Surgical Society Inside the Operating Room Series journey. We have the distinct honor of having Dr. Carlos Fernandez del Castillo as the first Latino surgeon who's participating with us in this new series. I'm Dr. Minerva Romero Arenas, and I'm an endocrine and general surgeon. I'm a founding member of the Latino Surgical Society, and I'm honored to have you join us today. I'd like to acknowledge the support of our sponsors without whom uh, this webinar session would not be possible. So I'd like to thank the Office of Diversity, Inclusion and Community Partnerships at Harvard Medical School, who has graciously um, ho uh, ho is hosting this webinar and is providing invaluable support in making this session possible. I'd also like to take the uh, time to thank the Massachusetts General Hospital Center for Diversity and Inclusion, who is supporting the event and is allowing us to continue our mission and growing our membership. Before we formally introduce Dr. Fernandez del Castillo and our interviewing panel, I'd like to take the time to tell you a little bit about the Latino Surgical Society. The Latino Surgical Society was established to cultivate Cultivate, nurture, and support the advancement of Latino surgeons. As you are well aware, we're the fastest growing minority group in the United States, and we're projected to grow from about 15% to almost 40% of the U.S. population, and some uh, more recent estimates actually have Latinos growing up to 50% of the U.S. population. We certainly face disparities that are disproportionate in the burden of disease. We have seen healthcare disparities relating to diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. We know uh, that there are disparities in, uh, in terms of Hispanic women having lower incidence of breast cancer, however, being diagnosed at more advanced stages. We have seen differences in cardiovascular procedures and the way that these are offered to patients. We certainly are aware of cultural and linguistic barriers, and we know that we have poor representation in research studies. Also, as everyone is aware, we are being disproportionately affected in current COVID-19 pandemic. However, we also face disparities in representation of our medical and surgical workforce. You can see that the number of US trained physicians uh, has not really changed significantly uh, and has remained uh, low in less than 10% for many years. Specifically looking at surgical specialties, you can see that uh, there are very few Hispanic or Latino uh, U.S. physicians. This is data from 2008, and you can see some of the major surgical specialties showing very small numbers. At the academic, in the academic setting, we also have seen that in the last decade, unfortunately, we're seeing a decrease in the number of academic surgeons uh, that are um, available for teaching and mentoring the next generation. And this shows you uh, the rank, I'm sorry, the academic surgical faculty who self-identified as Hispanic or Latino by their rank um, of assistance associate or full master. Unfortunately, we also are seeing that during residency, uh, there is a significant risk of attrition, particularly for women residents. And for Hispanic residents, the particularly alarming thing is that this attrition tends to occur every single year, whereas for non-Hispanic residents, attrition drops off largely after the first um, years in training. And Specifically, although attrition is highest during internship, late attrition is a problem for Hispanic uh, residents, for women, and for residents in larger military programs. Keeping all of that in mind, we founded the Latino Surgical Society uh, uh, four years ago. A couple of uh, friends and I all uh, met to really discuss um, a, a dire need in our community. Um, it just so happened that uh, Dr. Gesser Ortega, Dr. Joseph Lopez, and myself happened to be on call one night, all the stars aligned, and you had three Latino uh, surgeons uh, running the um, trauma service. So, uh, you know, we sort of thought about 
how many uh, peers we knew who were in training or how many faculty we knew who existed and, and really couldn't count very many people. And we knew that something had to be done. Um, and Dr. Joseph Fernandez Mode was also a uh, surgical resident at the time and shared similar interests. So the four of us came together to establish the society. Uh, as, we meant, as I mentioned earlier, the Latino Surgical Society was established to cultivate, nurture, and support the advancement of Latino surgeons. And I'll take you through a little bit of what we've done since we um, started the society. We've hosted meetings at the National Hispanic Medical Association uh, National Conference, uh, and we are very thankful to NHMA who has provided a lot of support over the past several years, allowing us meeting space um, and helping us um, have official programming during that conference. We also have hosted events, networking events at the American College of Surgeons Clinical Congress. And thankfully, uh, we have been able to connect with medical students, residents, and faculty across the country at various meetings and our numbers have um, that definitely continued to grow. This is another NHMA event in 2018. Our uh, large event at ACS in Boston, and uh, we uh, met again at the um, Academic Surgical Congress. This is an image from a networking dinner that we uh, hosted uh, just prior to the event starting. Uh, since then, we've been able to um, gain some traction and uh, have been invited to share the perspective uh, from the Latino community uh, among surgeons and have been able to invite some of our members to also share all of the um, wonderful research that they're involved in. Last year, we hosted a symposium at uh, the University uh, of Puerto Rico in San Juan. And most recently, our last in-person event, or actually our almost last in-person event, was the ACS with Dr. Green, who shared uh, words of wisdom for um, our networking lunch. Our last in-person event actually was at the Academic Surgical Congress just prior to the start of COVID, where we had Dr. Julianne Sosa uh, grace us with um, her presence and shared a lot of tips and advice for all those who attended. So we are certainly very glad to be reconnecting with you all because as you know, with the pandemic, uh, many events were canceled and that included our NHMA events um, and others that we had lined up like the um, SSO uh, around which we had aligned actually this event with Dr. Fernandez del Castillo. So we'd like to invite you to move forward with us. So with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and turn the virtual microphone over to my colleague, Dr. Gessa Ortega. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. My name is Dr. Gessa Ortega, and I am a founding member of the Latino Surgical Society. I am an instructor and the lead faculty for research and innovation for equitable surgical care at the Center for Surgery and Public Health at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Today, I'm sharing the interviewer panel with Drs. George Molina and Chantal Reina. Dr. George Molina will be conducting the interview. And last month, he completed his fellowship in complex general surgical oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Brigham and Women's Hospital and Massachusetts General Hospital combined program. He has now joined the Division of Surgical Oncology at Brigham and Women's Hospital as faculty. Dr. Chantal Reina is an assistant professor of surgery at the University of Cincinnati. And I'm excited to share that on September 1st, she will become an associate professor of surgery. And so she'll be one of those uh, data points on that chart that you had, Dr. Romero. And this <laughs> webinar, we will have the opportunity to ask questions using the Q&A function. And Dr. Reina and I will be reviewing questions and we'll select certain ones to ask Dr. Fernandez del Castillo. And with that, I will now pass it on to Dr. Reina. Thank you, Dr. Ortega. I have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished guest of honor. So Dr. Fernandez del Castillo. He is the director of the pancreas and biliary surgery program and clinical co-director of the GI Cancer Center at Massachusetts General Hospital. 
He is a professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School, and he is the inaugural incumbent of the Perez Endowed Chair of Surgery at Massachusetts General Hospital. He is widely recognized expert in pancreatic and biliary surgery and has authored over 350 publications. For several years, he has performed the largest number of pancreatic resections in New England. He serves on the editorial board of many journals, including the Annals of Surgery and Pancreatology, and he is a past president of the American Pancreatic Association. He has won numerous teaching awards and has mentored countless medical students, residents, and fellows during his time at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Can we all please give him a warm virtual welcome? And now I turn the interview over to Dr. Molina. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reyna. Um, Dr. Fernandez, it's a pleasure to be, in, uh, to be uh, have the chance to interview you. We're very honored that you are the inaugural um, uh, visitor for the Inside the Operating Room series. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a special honor for myself because you've been a mentor of mine since I was a medical student now more than some 13 years ago. And you've mentored me, um, you have guided me along during medical school, residency and fellowship. So thank you very much for that. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about our format for uh, today's interview. We're modeling the interview after uh, James Lipton's Inside the Actor's Studio. Um, as many of you may have seen or watched the, the, uh, these interviews, um, James Lipton would interview actors that had a profound impact on the industry. These interviews were, were multidimensional. They delved uh, deeply professionally and personally. Um, I will try to do justice to uh, the late James Lipton who actually passed away in March of this year. Um, he had a very unique interviewing style. Um, and I will end with some of the standard questions that he asked that I've modified a little bit to uh, meet uh, our, our, our series here. Um, but uh, let's begin. Dr. Fernandez, um, uh, we're honored to have you with us today. Uh, we're especially honored because you are a role model in, in American academic surgery. Uh, many of us know that you're originally from Mexico. Where in Mexico were you born and raised? First of all, um, muchas gracias. And gracias to Minerva and Yeser and, of course, Chantal and George. And this, is, this is wonderful. And I just, in the last 15 minutes, I learned things I did not know. I'm actually... Uh, before I answer George's question, I have to say I am in horror at seeing that attrition rate and would like to understand why more Hispanic surgical residents would leave the residency. And I have to say that if they're leaving is because they do not have mentors and maybe they need Latino mentors to help them. And they also need Latino role models, but need people who understand them and understand their, their, their peculiarities. And uh, this is something that needs to stop and that needs to be addressed. And if there's something that needs to be done, you know, including the creation of this society, right? So somebody who's in surgery training sees a society like this, should see that as an anchor to say, okay, why am I feeling so, so uncomfortable. Why do I feel like I need to quit? Why do I feel like I'm inadequate? Why do I feel like maybe the others are better than I am or they keep on telling me that when I feel that I'm okay? And, and this is something that we should all actively work in this and put it as a top goal. This cannot be different than it is for others. It cannot be different. And uh, I don't know where this data came from, but if it is accurate, it is absolutely wrong from beginning to end. So. Yes, I was born in Mexico City. I, I was born, raised. I went to medical school and actually I did my surgical training in Mexico. This is where I was and, and where I felt my life would be and, and grow. And I'm extremely proud of being Mexican. And uh, I love my country. I, and, uh, and I came here to do training, further training, right? So I. When I finished my training in Mexico, they offered me a position to stay where I trained, which is in a, in a tertiary care hospital in Mexico City called Instituto Nacional de la Nutrición Salvador Subirán. And it's like, you know, the top place in the country for complex GI surgery and endocrine surgery. And it was a big honor that they offered me the job. And they said, look, we want you to do pancreas surgery. This is 1989. And, uh, and there was a surgeon there who did pancreas surgery. He was an outstanding surgeon. He was my teacher. He was one of my mentors and, and you know, he would be retiring in a few years. So they said, look, you should go there and train. 
but you need to go outside so that you come back and bring new things. And at that time, there was no formal training. So there's no HPV fellowships. There's no advanced training for, for, for anybody who wanted to do that. So what I did is I wrote to, to many, many pancreatic surgeons in the United States, and I only got one answer back. So this is 1989. There's no email. There's no internet. There's no really computer. So these were all typewritten letters. I remember I sent many. And uh, it only got one response back. And that was Dr. Warshaw, who said, oh, I'm, thank you for your interest, but you know, we don't have any positions available uh, now. Uh, we do have a research laboratory where we do that, but you know, we don't have a space for you right now. And, and then I wrote back immediately and I said, look, please reconsider this. I, I really want to go. And I think he was amused at me being so insistent. And I think this is the first uh, message to everybody that, you know, don't take no for an answer. And when you have an opportunity, you know, insist. There's no harm in doing that. And, uh, and I knew that he was going to go to the American College of Surgeons. And I said, well, if you will, can I look for you in the American College of Surgeons? And can I, you know, meet you in person? And, and perhaps, perhaps, you know, we can agree on something. And so he was giving lectures. You know, he was probably one of the top two or three prominent surgeons and pancreas in the country or in the world. And uh, I went to his, you know, big lecture at the American College of Surgeons. And when he finished, I approached him and I started to talk to him. And the first thing he said, I am very surprised that you speak English so well, <laughs> which was kind of interesting. You know? and, and I think he expected that I would not be able to, you know, interview in English or speak or anything. He said, huh. And then he said, okay, uh, well, if you want to come, we'll, we'll have a space for you. <laughs> and that was exactly what I wanted. And then, you know, a couple of months later, I was here and I started what was a research fellowship. Again, there was no clinical. However, I, I knew that I had to go back to Mexico and not to do research, certainly not laboratory research. I mean, there's a, some of that going on, but back then there was not a lot. I was gonna go back and expect to take care of patients and, and do that well and learn what they were doing. So I started shadowing Dr. Warshaw in the operating room, in the rounds, in clinic, in addition to spending time in the laboratory. And I think that was a very unique opportunity because it allowed, you know, for me to have exposure and, and he saw that I had a good training in, in GI. So it's interesting where I trained in Mexico, before you were allowed to do a residency in surgery, you had to do internal medicine. You had to do two years of internal medicine, the same as any other internal medicine resident with the same duties, responsibilities and everything. And, and it was a place that was very focused on, on you making good clinical medicine, good diagnosis, good plans of care. And so I had that sort of background training, and I think uh, that probably reflected a little bit on the discussion of the cases. So Dr. Warshaw, who's actually, you know, a highly critical person, you know, he's, he's very, very, uh, very astute and, and picks up on things, you know, must have been, you know, sort of said, well, you know, it seems like he knows his stuff. And at the same time, things in the laboratory went very well. Back then in the laboratory, we were working almost exclusively in acute pancreatitis. And we had a lot of animal models and we worked on that. And in addition, I, I, I was given the charge of doing a clinical study. So, you know, just as an anecdote, when I came here, the first day I arrived, you know, and I went to Dr. Warshaw's office and, you know, he was there and he said, oh, Carlos, I'm happy you're here. You know, your job in the next two years is to find out why patients who undergo heart surgery develop pancreatitis. Because as you know, this happens. Of course, I did not know that. <laughs> I had absolutely no idea. Said, so you are going to figure that out because you're going to design a clinical study for us to find out. These are my theories. And he told me he felt there was ischemia during cardiopulmonary bypass that was leading to pancreatitis. He thought in particular that it was the phenylephrine that was used during cardiac surgery that would cause pancreatitis. And, um, and then he said, and you're going to design something in the laboratory to unravel this. So I left his office and I went directly to the library. So again, this is 1989, there's no internet. So there's no PubMed, there's nothing, you know, there's something called the Index Medicus and maybe most of you were born after 1989. So you 
don't know what this is, these big tomes in the library. And I spent literally two days entirely in the library just going through those tomes and picking up every single paper that was written on pancreatitis after heart surgery. And after reading that, you know, I had a number of hypotheses myself, and we designed a clinical study, a prospective clinical study. And uh, it was a lot of work, but I was not afraid of work. You know, I think uh, I had to prove myself. I, I was enthusiastic about what I was doing, which is very important. Um, but I also knew that I had to work very hard because this was a unique opportunity because I wanted to do things well. And so we did that clinical study and that revealed that the reason that patients were developed pancreatitis was the calcium that was given during cardiopulmonary bypass. And enormous amounts of calcium were given to, to it, as the patients were leaving pump. And, and this was almost a linear correlation with, 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 uh, with pancreatitis. And the finding was so, 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 uh, so astounding in some way that we managed to publish the paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, which was like unprecedented, right? And I think that impressed people enough that, that they said, wow, you know, maybe we got something here. And at the same time in the laboratory we did, we were very successful. And that's why in a very unusual manner, I ended up here because my plan was to go back to Mexico. Of course, I had already gone into the operating room with Dr. Warshaw and I had, you know, been with him in clinic many, many, many times and in rounds, and I had learned how he did things and why his results were so good. But then he called me in the office and said, well, why don't you stay with us? You stay with us as much as you want, one year, two years, five years, a lifetime, and uh, continue to do research and, and be a clinical surgeon. So this was a very unique opportunity because remember, my training was in Mexico. I did not have the American Board of Surgery, right? I had the Mexican Board of Surgery. But it so happened that in 1991, you know, you, you could do this. And that's how I ended up coming here to the United States. And I had a plan of staying here for two years, make some money. You know, with my wife and I, we had two children at that time and, and you know, had zero money. So I was going to go back to Mexico with nothing and say, well, if I stay here, I can make a little bit of a piggy bank and take money back. And so we won't start that, that dirt burn. And then those two years have become a lifetime. And I feel myself the luckiest, the luckiest uh, man on earth because I have the greatest job. I love what I do. And um, do I regret it sometimes? Um, not professionally at all. I think uh, professionally, this is the best opportunity any person interested in what I'm interested in could have. Um, but, but you do because you, you miss your roots, right? And I'll never forget that I that I am Mexican, and I never will will I, I will continue to miss that until I, the day I die. And this seems like a romantic notion, right? Um, you know, but this is this is this is where I am from. And uh, of course, now I, I I'm an American, you know, as well, and I have an American passport, and I have also a Mexican passport. You know, you can have dual nationality, and this is okay. And uh, and I'm very proud of this country, which gives so many opportunities to, to many of us. Many in this audience, you know, have probably received a lot of grateful things from, from here. This is this is an incredible place. But I still I still miss 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 my country and of course all my family, my parents, my brothers, my sisters, my uncles, my cousins, my grandparents, everybody was in Mexico. So that's something that you miss. But I grew up, and I grew up in a sort of an extended family, you know, very close, as it is very common in our Latino heritage, right? That, you know, grandma and grandpa on one side and on the other side, and your cousins and your uncles are all over you, and your cousins are like your brothers. And, 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 and this is something that is different here in the United States, right? So it's, 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 not, the, it's not the model. Uh, here, people live dispersed throughout the country. Over there, you tend to stay where you grew up, right? So that's why the families are so close together and because there's a special loyalty amongst families that I think um, that's all. So, so I miss that. And I, my regret is that my children don't seem to have that same, um, that, that same sense of family, that same sense of we, we belong to a clan. And, and, uh, and again, it may be sort of a romantic, old-fashioned notion that this matters. I, I think it does matter. Um, 
but uh, but if, on the other hand, they're growing up in this country and they and they have, are getting all the benefits that it is from a country like this, of which I'm also very proud. Thank you. I've I've heard uh, you know bits of that story, and every time that I hear that story, you know your story, it's just so impressive, and um, it's really inspiring. You know, one thing that uh, that I have heard going back to the data that, that Dr. Romero uh, presented and your comments initially is the sense that as Latinos, we are close to our families. You know, my family's in South Florida and I've been coming, I've been going, you know, more north as I've gone to college and medical school. And now I'm going to be staying in Boston for, for my first academic job. What what would you tell a, a, uh, a you know, person uh, of color, uh, unrepresented minority, a Latino who comes from these very tight knit families who wants to go to, you know, the best medical school, who wants to go to the best residency, but, you know, we have this, this, this kind of, this tension, you know, you've talked about it, you know, a little bit, and it sounds like you have, you know, really, you know, you've coped with it well, but for the younger people in the audience, you know, what would you tell them if, if that's an impediment for them to try to strive for the mass general, you know, general surgery residency program, for example, um, or for current residents who are struggling with that, you know, current residents who are away from home and general surgery residency is, is hard. It's, it's hard. It's long hours. It's, it's, you know, tough rotations. What would you tell them, you know, about this longing to go back home um, and how to keep moving forward? So I guess if I had to say something that, that stuck, I would say, do not be afraid, right? We are all very comfortable in, 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 in that nest where we grow, in the community where we grow. We know the people. We have a certain standing, right? You know, you're a doctor, right? So people look up to you because you're a doctor and, and you, you have knowledge and you can tell them what medicine to take or not to take and, and they look up to you and then you're, you have an opportunity to go far away where you're gonna be nothing, right? You're gonna be a doctor amongst many doctors and you're not gonna be, you know, you're gonna stand out maybe because your heritage is different. Do not be afraid. You have to do that. That's part of your, of your growth. And if you have the privilege or the opportunity to go to a medical school or to go to a training program that is, that is better than what you would have at your reach where you are growing up, you absolutely have to do that. And you will never forget your roots, hopefully, right? I don't, I don't think so. I think in, in, in us Latinos, you know, that weighs so much, whether it's bread in the bone, you know, or whether it comes, you know, from our mothers and, 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 and our fathers and that sense of family, I think, I think, you know, and we stay in touch, you know, this, 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 this will never disappear, right? Uh, sure. Then you, some, some may marry an American or, or some, somebody from a different heritage and, and, uh, and maybe it's going to be a little bit different and maybe you're speaking English at home as opposed to Spanish at home and maybe you're starting eating a little different. But, you know, you will never forget what your roots are. And you have to make an effort. You know, everything else, everything is the investment you put into that, right? So if you're in touch with your parents, which I hope, you know, we all feel sort of close to our parents when they're there and when they're alive or when they're present, you know, such as parents may not be there, but their siblings or cousins or uncles, you have to go back to them in terms of talking and having conversations. And now with, you know, with all the... the Zoom and all these all things, it, 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 is, it is so much easier. But don't be afraid. Do not be afraid to go and grow. And, uh, you know, actually you have a duty. You know, when, when you've had a privilege that, that you come from a background where maybe a lot of people didn't even go to college and you went to college and now you have an opportunity, you went to medical school and, and you've done well there to the point that you can go to, to train in, 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 a, in a program that is, you know, not just ordinary, but better than ordinary, well, you have the duty of doing that, right? You have the duty to, to yourself, but you have the duty to all colleagues and to all Latinos to show that you can excel there. And certainly not go there and, and on the second year quit or the third year quit, because that's that's something that should not be happening. I don't know why, but should not be happening. So it's uh, I'm always impressed by your story because you have really excelled uh, you know, during these past 20, 30 years. And I'm curious to know if you could tell us more about the world of surgery back in those days at MGH and beyond, and what would you say has changed for good or for bad? 
So I think I think uh, things have changed for good. So back in 1991, a place like Mass General, and I would probably say with and not be wrong in, in many top places, you know, just think of any prestigious sort of a surgical training program, um, was a very inbred system, right? So the surgeons who worked at Mass General, the surgeons who worked at Hopkins, the surgeons that worked at Penn and UCSF, most of them were surgeons that had trained there, right? So, so systems tend to be inbred, and, and, and you know, there's a sense that we do so things so much better that you know, we're going to hire our own people because why would we want to hire somebody else from the outside, right? Of course, there, there were some people from the outside, but here at least at MGH was a very inbred system. So here comes this unique opportunity, right? So, w w why am I where I am? It is only happenstance. Yes, you you work hard, but, but a lot of people can work very hard and not have that. This was an opportunity that was given to me and I was, I took it. You know, maybe I took it for greedy reasons saying, well, they're going to pay me well, I'm going to make some money, right? But 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 also I love what I was doing and, and, and that, taking that opportunity sort of helped a lot. So I come to MGH, this is 1991, and probably there were not more than three or four surgeons that had trained outside of the MGH. So I was not only an outsider, but I was an outsider from south of the Rio Grande, right? So, so this was seen with some suspicion, right? And there was some suspicion of saying, you know, this guy, this guy can't be good enough, right? Where did he even train? We don't even know where he is right, from. And can can he really take care of patients? Can he really, you know, be responsible for somebody's open abdomen? <laughs> um, jeepers, this doesn't. Kind of, you mean he's going to do only research, right? No, he can't be taking care of patients, right? And yet, I had, you know, a, a great surgeon, Dr. Warsha, who was the vice chairman of the department, you know, take a leap and say, yes, you're going to do this. And, uh, and gave me that opportunity, and I was able to prove that I could do it well. But there was a lot of suspicion, a lot of suspicion, and some people who would, you know, just for years would probably ignore me, right? And you would say, oh, my gosh, you know, they're mean people. Well, you know, I don't know. I think that that has changed a lot, and we've seen it in, in, in the treatment of, 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 you know, within all these sort of sacred institutions, to all kinds of minorities, right? Not just to Latinos, but to but to all minorities, which are now much more welcome, although there's still some problems and there's still some prejudice. And this it is prejudice. And that prejudice can lead to covert or overt discrimination or mistreatment. I think it's a lot less now than it was back then. And I have you know you have had you have to have a tough skin. You can be a little delicate flower that, you know, somebody made some bad comment, you know, I'm going to feel like, you know, uh, less and I'm going to be hurt and I'm going to go and complain. I guess you could go and complain because, you know, something should not be tolerated. But, uh, but no, you have a tough skin and, and, and you do, as I've told, you know, over the years I've advised many, many, uh, many students. And, and many research fellows, and as you can imagine, a lot of foreign medical graduates, you know, come here and work doing research, right? And, and what their dream is to be able to do their residency in the United States, you know, and the door is very, very narrow for somebody who trained outside, right, to be able to train in the United States. And some of them managed to do that and managed to do that very well and to get into a top program. And then when I'm advising them after I've known them is, there's one single thing you have to do. You have to work harder than everybody else. Because people are going to look down on you. They said, this guy is here. And, you know, and quite frankly, this is not just advice for the foreign medical graduate. You know, and most of the ones that I've advised have been Latino because they gravitate towards me because of the commonality of our heritage. But even medical students, right? And I may have given that advice to George at some point. George was always a very, very qualified medical student. Right, but you go in there and say, well, you know, people may look at you and say, you know, he's here just because he's a Latino, right? And because we had to have a face like his in our photographs, because otherwise people would say, you know, we're not inclusive. 
So, you know, why are you going to go and prove them that they're completely wrong? And the only way to prove it is you work a lot harder than others. And that's an advice that I give I give to, to people who, who are of this background. I think things are changing. And, you know, uh, it's not that you have to do more than the others, but you really have to give your best and sometimes have to prove a little bit more. I'm, um, I've, uh, you know, you've trained me and I've spent many times, many hours and days in the operating with you, but um, if you could tell us more about uh, your teaching style in the operating room. Well, I, 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 I'll start by saying that, you know, there's many things I do professionally, right? I, I take care of patients. I love seeing patients. I love, you know, making diagnosis. I love, you know, you know, sort of a challenging sort of cases. Uh, I love to do research, right? Um, I'm still involved in some laboratory research, but, you know, clinical research, having a question and finding a way to answer it. I love to present the research and be challenged. You know, I like the debate. You know, I like to be in meetings and, you know, get into arguments and, and ask, you know, probing questions. I like the the friendships that you develop when you're moving to academic, you know, Benson. So you, you start to meet people that are in your sort of same circles of debate and, 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 and then you make friends. And this is more true for the international scene. So, you know, you start going to other countries and you meet people who are, and it's just, been, it's, it's wonderful. I love to operate. I love to be in the operating room, right? My wife makes fun of me because I sometimes get home and I start to give directions. And listen, this is not your operating room. You're not deciding here what to do. <laughs> you're, not, you're, not, you're not the boss. So I love, I love being in the operating room. But what gives me, without doubt, the biggest pleasure of all is teaching, right? And, and where I am, I have the unique privilege of working with extremely talented and motivated individuals, right? So the residents at NGH are just, you know, the top and they're so good and they're so, you know, capable and they're so willing to improve that that is what gives me the most. And not just the residents, but teaching to the students, right? So being in a classroom and teaching or being in the operating room and teaching. And I, I, I have, you know, I don't know how unique my style is, but I like to, you know, teach by challenging and asking questions and asking probing questions and and not questions that are automatically, the person is going to know the answer, but they have to think about the answer. So a little bit of the Socratic method, you know, in, in going back and forth. Um, I do not believe in malignant teaching, right? So I, I never want to ask a question to humiliate somebody and to show them that they don't know. But I sometimes make them feel uncomfortable that they don't know something that they should know, right? <laughs> And I, I, I can laugh about it with them and I can send them with homework and then the next day ask them and then they have this, this pleasure of being able to, 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 to give an answer that they've come up with because they've done their research. I think uh, you, I, 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 I love to teach in the operating room. You're teaching technique, but you're also teaching about problems. You're teaching about physiology. You're teaching about anatomy. You're teaching about, you know, I like to quiz people so they're 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 used to my quizzes sometimes my quizzes are kind of silly but 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 you want to make them fun you, you sometimes make games in the operating room right and you say okay okay we're going to come up with a list of all the things that can happen from this we're going to go around and let's see who cannot name it and that will be the loser nobody likes to be losers right because they're all overachievers and nobody wants to be the loser but I think uh, I, I enjoy teaching, and that's what gives me the greatest satisfaction. And I think an academic surgeon, if you have the opportunity to be in academics, you are very lucky. You are very lucky because, you know, you're not just going to operate, which hopefully any surgeon loves to operate, but you're going to be able to have this interaction with, with the residents, with the students, and hopefully do some research and feel satisfaction by being able to publish a paper and, and present it and, 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 and get into the debate. So uh, so something about you that's a little more personal, but uh, I think you'd be comfortable sharing this, is that you have a large family, nine children. That is right. That is so, right. so how were you able to raise so many children, be present at home, and still be successful in academic surgery? Well, I, I you know, when my wife and I got married, we, we knew that we wanted to have a large family. I don't think we quite thought about nine children. 
because that is not just large, it's a very large family. Um, but when it was clear that we were going to stay in the United States, I think that fact made us have a large family because we felt that what the best thing we could give our children is, of course, an education, but also each other. So having their brothers and sisters is would be something something great. And the credit, I mean, they're all absolutely wonderful. I mean, I, I have been blessed by God that my kids have never given me a day of grief in terms of anything anything bad, which is, I know it's luck, and, and it is really the credit of my wife. So my wife, my wife, uh, you know, she, she went to college in, in Mexico. She's much smarter than I am, right? So she was, she had a very good job, which she left with, when, when we came to the States. And then we had children. And then, you know, uh, we were able to, to live on one salary, on my salary. And, uh, and uh, she felt that her best shot was to take care of the children, right? And I know times have changed. Now it's different and different, you know, uh, but we were lucky with that. And I think uh, having that large family was possible because she was devoted to them 100%. Like she says, she has nine full-time jobs right? because raising all the children and doing all the things they have to do. Um, I think finding that balance is hard. And, and I think if you're an academic surgeon and if you're a busy academic surgeon, that means your day starts at you know 5.30 in the morning and sometimes finishes at 9 p.m., so you're not at home. Uh, you often will have dinner alone, you know, or maybe somebody will sit with you and have dinner, but everybody else has had dinner. And what I do is I do this Monday through Friday. And when the weekends come, I do not take any work home. That's, that, that's my rule, right? Unless I'm on call. If I'm on call, well, then I'm on call, and that's it. But thankfully, here at MGH, we're not on call that often so uh, when i'm on call i'm very very busy but when i'm not i go home and i nothing nothing i don't take work back it's time that my kids have for me that my wife has for me we try to do fun things and, and, and i think that that divorce model works it would not be realistic for me to be at home at five o'clock or six o'clock every day to have dinner it just would not would not happen for for a surgeon is hard maybe for some surgical specialties you can where you can schedule things more but if you're doing big cases pancreas surgery you know you're, you're not going to be able to say the clock stops here goodbye i'm leaving i'm going to now turn it over to uh, doctors ortega and reina there's a lot of audience questions and they'll they'll go ahead and, and choose from those and ask happy to Thank you, uh, Dr. Molina and Dr. Fernandez de Castillo. And uh, first question comes from, and you touched upon it earlier, but um, there is a student who is interested in, they're applying to general surgery residency and they're looking for general surgery programs. And as they make their list and they think about programs, are, are there any words of wisdom regarding how to battle against attrition or how to decide on what programs to go into? Well, I think, uh, you know, what I learned earlier today, you know, from, you know, Minerva's presentation, all of the attrition sort of alarms me and makes me, makes me reflect on something. That if you go to a program and you're going to be able to have some support, family-wise, spouse-wise, or partner-wise, uh, that's going to count for a lot. You know, yes, internship is a very difficult year. It can be miserable. It can be sort of exhausting, you know, and sometimes, you know, it brings the worst of people, not of the intern, but it was the worst of, you know, older residents, you know, who can mistreat, and there's a malignant culture in some places, and maybe that's what leads to attrition. If you have support, right, if you have support, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be in your same city, right? But you have the support because you have a family that is willing to listen to you every day if you have to, right? And you get on the phone and talk to them or go or FaceTime or whatever. If you have that spouse that is going to be sympathetic and listen to you or that partner, or that good friend that can do that, that makes a big difference. So if you're going to go to a place and you're going to be completely isolated and not going to be able to see anybody, you know, and have that warmth and share that meal, it's going to be harder. I think, uh, I really think that 
a place that has Latino surgeons is going to be easier for a Latino resident, right? You get somebody you can gravitate to. I mean, we are all very, solidarity is natural to us, right? As it is natural to people from other nationalities, I think mostly, right? If you're from, you know, you know, Croatia and, and there's another Croatian, well, you know, they just bond with each other just because because it's it's uncommon. And the same thing I think happens. Right? So if you have if you have your options open and you see a, a, a program and you can see the background of the surgeons that work there and that are involved, you know, in the teaching and say, hey, look, there's three or four Latinos. Well, it's going to be a lot easier. Now, I realize that that may not be the case, right? There's not a lot of Latino surgeons and there's not a lot of programs that can be diverse enough to have that. But that would be useful. Uh, and again, proximity to family matters. You know, if you say, look, I'm only two hours away. I have a weekend free. I can take a bus. Even if I'm dog tired, I can sleep on the bus and get home and have a nice family meal and spend time with my parents or with my brothers and my sisters. Well, that counts a lot, right? If I'm in California and my family is in New York, it's going to be a little harder, right? No, I completely agree with that. And so thank you for that advice. We have a couple of questions that are similar. So I'm going to combine them here. So really they want to know, have you ever mentored non-traditional students? And we're talking about either international medical graduates or people who are older. And really they want to know how can you overcome some of the challenges when you're a non-traditional student applying to a competitive residency such as surgery? I mean, sometimes the obvious ways such as the step scores, the research experience rotations are just not enough. Um, and what advice can you give those non-traditional students? Yeah, so I have. I have, I, I have mentored uh, many, many uh, international medical graduates you know, that, that have worked with me doing research sometimes, you know, for a year or two, sometimes for a brief period of time. And uh, you get to know them and, and because you know that they're very good, you're willing to go out to bat for them, right? And I think... Uh, I, I, I do everything I can, meaning writing strong letters, but also making phone calls to try to support people to do things. Uh, I think uh, you have to, my, my advice is you have to aim high, also have your feet on the ground. It's a very uphill, you know, uh, journey. So it's, it's tough. It's tough to get there. Sometimes you have to be creative and take preliminary spots so that you can prove yourself, right? I tell them that it's going to be a lot easier if they have some pedigree, meaning they have some publications or they have some presentations. This matters, right? If you just say, oh, I was there uh, and I worked, but I didn't do anything, well, that's going to be against you. Um, so it's hard. It's hard. On the other hand, we, we must keep in mind that I think it's maybe, you know, Minerva or somebody else has, has different numbers, but I think it's like in the mid-teens, of the residency positions in surgery in the United States are filled by foreign medical graduates, right? So the reality is that the programs need foreign medical graduates. Of course, some of those positions may not be attractive, right? Maybe in places that are not great hospitals, but sometimes you take that to start and then prove yourself and jump somewhere else. I've mentored some that have been extraordinarily successful. And I've also mentored some that have not been able to do that. So when I talk to them, I say, look, we got to have a plan B and a plan C, right? And if your dream, which is to become a surgeon, does not crystallize, then um, you, you have to be open to other things, right? And there may be other surgical specialties where you could get in, or there could be, you know, something related to surgery, like anesthesia, where it may be a little bit easier to sort of crack the, 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 the opening and, and, and get in there. So I mean, it's, it's many conversations and you have to be a little bit like a father who's giving advice, right? And, and uh, you, you don't want people to end up being so disappointed that they feel like they're a failure and then they, 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 they cannot thrive. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez. Um, and we have a question from a trainee, a mentee of yours, um, who's worked with you over the past decade. And um, 
he wanted to know, can you talk more, and you mentioned mentorship in your response earlier, but can you talk more about the mentorship challenges with a mentee or failed mentorship experience, if any, and what lessons have you learned um, from that possible uh, pitfall? So I, I have the best education in mentorship because I had an outstanding mentor, right? So, so Dr. Warshaw was for me an incredible mentor. I had mentors in Mexico that helped me get to the point of applying. Um, but, you know, he was the perfect model for mentorship. And, and, and what he was is somebody who was willing to impart wisdom, somebody who delivered, right? So I, I remember writing manuscripts with Dr. Warshaw and again, this was before there were any computers, right? So there's, so there's no, you know, you, you're typing in a typewriter, right? And, and it's, it's work. And I would give a manuscript to him. And the next morning, it was all corrected. I mean, to the commas, to the periods, to the references, everything. And I would give him the next version and the same thing. So he was very responsive. So a mentor needs to make a sacrifice and say, even though I'm busy, I'm going to do this for you. A mentor is someone who always has his door open, right? You can't say, I'm going to be a mentor. Yeah, but you can see me, you know, Thursdays from 4.30 to 5 p.m., right? No, a mentor is there. And if you need it, you have a crisis or you have a, a question, you need to be able to, to, to open the door, right? And, and, and then, you know, be sincere and be able to point out what, what is not going well and what is going well, uh, you know, have a, have a sense of humor also to be able to to convey that when it's when it's necessary and i think uh that's that's the most important thing knowing each other knowing each other so so the mentor needs to know the mentee for sure but the mentee also needs to know the mentor right so that so that there is a, there's a there's a good connection there uh it's chemistry like so many in human relationships it's a chemistry and, and that chemistry sometimes doesn't work right sometimes it doesn't work because we're different I think uh, it's easier for me to mentor almost any Latino. I understand many of things, but uh, that's it. Oh, thank you. And so as we keep becoming more and more interconnected and we start highlighting things that have been struggles, the terms macroaggressions and microaggressions have really started coming to the forefront. So a couple of the questions from our audience is, do you have any strategies for those trainees or students who are experiencing um, belittling or even patronizing behaviors towards them? Well, that's a delicate point, delicate point. So my nature, this is, has nothing to do with my Latino heritage. This is just my nature in terms of, you know, my upbringing a little bit, I think, and or my temperament is to have a tough skin, right? So like I said before, you know, you can be a delicate flower that somebody said something, you know, you didn't like and do it. On the other hand, things have changed and, and behavior that was tolerated 30 years ago or 25 years ago or 20 years ago is no longer tolerated. Uh, you know, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell an anecdote that is not very pleasant, right? But but I'll use it to educate and say, well, it doesn't hurt to me, right? But you know, I and it was told to me by my mentor, right? So again, I had come to MGH, and you know, not everybody thought it was a good idea that I would be a staff member, and I was a staff member, and then one day, you know, a surgeon surgeon who was known to be very arrogant and you know of course he was you know a wasp right so you know here i am doing a microaggression wasp or you know he was a traditional sort of englander told dr warshaw kind of like so andy now you you you, you brought here your little helper to to help you eh? it's uh, um you know and used a very derogative word for for somebody who's crossed the border illegally right and um you know, I'll say it. He said, you brought your wet back to help you here, right? And, you know, I think that's, I think that's offensive. Does it offend me to the point that I would say I'm hurt and every time I see that person, I'm going to, uh, you know, he didn't tell me which cardiac surgeon had said that, but, you know, you could imagine that it was one of two or three that were there that were noted for that. 
Well, you can be working with a chip on your shoulder. You just sort of ignore it, ignore it. I think times are different. On the other hand, I frown a little bit at people who are so sensitive, so sensitive that there's, you know, even if something is said in humor or in goodwill, we'll take it in the wrong way. And I know that this is, this is we're living in an era of political correctness and we're living in an era of, of you know, it, this is good for the most extent, but, but don't be so delicate that any comment is going to be bad. Now, if someone, one of your co-interns or one of your co-residents, you know, refers to you in a derogatory way, especially implying that you're lazy or that you are there because you're a Latino and otherwise you wouldn't be here, well, you stand up and say what it is. I don't think the way to stand up is to go and report him with a safety report and, and you know, making a, a no, stand up like a like a strong woman or a strong man and say, you know, I'm I'm sorry, but you're mistaken, right? And and, and I think that what you're saying is wrong, and uh, just speak up for yourself. That's the advice I give to my kids, right? So if you're in middle school or high school and there's a bully or there's somebody who you got to stand up and speak up, and again, do not be afraid. Thank you for those comments. And so, and speaking of middle school and kids, and we and we talking about the next generation, we have a couple of medical students on this uh, webinar, and they have asked, like, how important is it to do research? You talked a lot about research, and is it should they get a PhD at some point in their medical career? Um, you know, what will it contribute to their experience as a doctor, and will it grant them better opportunities? I think the general answer to that question is yes. If you have an opportunity to do research and you do it, it's going to open doors. It's also going to make you a better doctor, a more thoughtful sort of thinker, a more thoughtful critic of, you know, of, of the literature, you know, right? If you have experience in clinical research or in outcomes, or if you have experience in a laboratory research, and you read a paper, you're gonna be a better critic if you've actually done that, right? And you say, gee, I know this, this is a lot of work. <laughs> or I know this, this is BS, right? This is, this is useless. But only if you've done the research. I think it does open doors. I think, uh, you know, uh, if, you feel, if you feel that your heritage I don't think anybody should feel that the heritage should be a handicap to get into any program. I think we're living in the 21st century and you know, whether you're Latino or whether you're black or whether you're you know, of a totally different persuasion or background or whatever, you know, that is not gonna close doors. If anything, it can may open more doors because now there's so much impetus for diversity, right? That, that, that the people who select candidates for things realize the richness that it can bring to being people from diverse backgrounds. So I don't think it's because of that. But if you feel that, um, that, that, that you want to have something else to show for it, yes, doing research is going to be something that is going to be helpful. And, and if you have that opportunity, do it. Um, like everything else in life, you know, it, it, it would be nice if you like it. Right? If you don't like it and you say, my gosh, this is horrible. I'm just doing this because I want to put something in my resume. Well, then that's probably not great. So. I think one of the questions I think would be very nice to hear is, what do you identify as a quality of all aspiring academic surgeons should possess? I think this goes to, do they need to be very research, very questionable? What is it do you think that would make a great ideal quality? I think uh, if you said, what is the sine qua non? What is the quality that any academic surgeon should have? Uh, it's not necessarily research, right? So there, there, there are tremendous academic surgeons who don't, are, are not researchers. Uh, it, it is probably education and forming other people, right? And forming um, you know, students. So an academic surgeon by definition should be willing and open to teach, to teach medical students and to teach uh, uh, residents for sure. I don't think you know you can be an academic surgeon and, and not do that. Maybe there's some exceptions and there's some academic surgeons who do such high level of research 
that they interact very little with the residents or with the students. I, I don't think that there's many of those. But the sine qua non should be mentorship, right? So if you are an academic surgeon and you are not willing to mentor, if you're not willing to give a hand to others to lift them, if you're not willing to give guidance to others to, to grow, well, then you're probably not an academic surgeon, right? And how sad that you would leave your career, you know, when, when, when the time comes for you to retire and then you say, well, I really didn't mentor anyone. So if you're an academic surgeon, you have to have mentor somebody, be it, you know, at, at whatever level. It's not necessarily that you're doing research, but it's teaching, it's giving career advice. Thank you for that response. And we've had over a hundred panelists and a hundred participants so far on this talk. And then many of them, I'm sure, are mentees and people that have like followed your career as well as um, our organization. And we are excited to have you here. And some of the questions that have come in, these are, this is a two part question for you. One is, what do you feel are the two most important aspects of choosing a fellowship program? Similar to residency, but now this is directed at our residents when they're looking to choose a fellowship program, but also an academic position. Uh, for those that are thinking about junior faculty positions and where to go, what are your thoughts on that? So, um, well, that's probably one of the most important decisions that a surgical resident is gonna make, right? So A, am I gonna do a fellowship, right? Most people now say, you know, I gotta do some kind of fellowship. Uh, am I gonna do it? And B, what am I gonna do? And you know, well, you, my, my advice, my generic advice is choose something that you're good at and that you're passionate about, right? So if I am very good at, you know, at meticulous dissection in like in the neck and I, I can do that and I just challenge because I, I like to do these things very well, but I'm also passionate about that because I, you know, I've got some research going on about thyroid cancer or hyperparathyroidism and I really love it. Well, then you found your niche, right? And this is, this is great. You know, if you say, look, I am passionate about the rapid decision making, the change of pace, the adrenaline rushing, you know, when I get somebody coming through the emergency room, you know, after a trauma, and that drives me. And I'm also pretty darn good at keeping control in the operating room, right? Because if I do that and I panic in the operating room, well, that's going to be a bad combination, you know, even if I love that. So you need to find something you're passionate and something you're good at. Now, life is not always that simple, right? And sometimes I say, well, gee, I like I like everything, sort of, I like it very well. Nothing really makes me incredibly passionate. Uh, I'm good, you know, I can operate, I can do things. Well, then you also have to think from the practical standpoint and say, okay, well, uh, what is the market for colorectal surgeons, right? What is the market for endocrine surgeons? What is the market for acute care surgeons? You know, those things matter. And then into that very complex equation, which now becomes like a third degree sort of equation, is what else is going on in my life, right? Because if you're a unidimensional person, is it all that matters is surgery in my career and nothing else matters? Well, that's fine. But if you have a family, right? And, uh, and you, well, you need to think of them as well, right? And say, okay, this is what's gonna work out. It turns out that, you know, my spouse is someone who, you know, travels five days a week. Yeah, and I want to be an acute care surgeon. Well, maybe it ain't going to work that fine because I'm going to have to be on call at nights a lot and that's not going to work well, right? Or maybe it will work because if I'm an acute care surgeon, I can predict the days I'm going to work and when I can leave the hospital and when I can come in, right? So all those logistics go into that. Find something that you love, that you're good at, um, you know, the, 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 the logistics of your family or personal situation and what the market is like, right? Don't go and choose a subspecialty that is oversaturated, right? Especially in the place in, of the country where you want to live in, well, that maybe doesn't, doesn't go that well, right? And, uh, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, you know, I ask myself, well, I, I, I do pancreas surgery. Could I do any other kind of surgery? The answer is yes, yes. 
Of course I do, you know. I, 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 I love to operate and I love to do a nice dissection. I like to do, a, you know, and so if, if, if life forced me to something else, well, I could have done it, right? Uh, so within surgery, everything I think is quite nice. So we're lucky. I mean, imagine you could be, you know, primary care doctor. <laughs> that may not be as cool, right? Or you could be, a, I don't know, a psychiatrist, and that may not be as cool. You know, we're surgeons. We love to be in the operating room. We love to operate. We love to use our hands. We have this creative force within us. And whether it's directed at the breast or at endocrine or a complex oncological surgery or, you know, you name it, you know, we're going to be okay. Don't be afraid. That's another message. Don't be afraid of saying, you know, I'm going to choose this fellowship and what if I don't love it? No, just be thoughtful. All right. Well, we have one last question before we hand this back to Dr. Molina. What would you identify as your most meaningful accomplishment? Wow. Well, I, I, I think being a good father after I've said that, that, um, that I'm not, that all the credit goes to my wife, you know, but it's interesting that, you know, even though I'm not at home most of the time, you know, there's an image of, of, of me and my kids know that I'm working and I'm doing it for them because ultimately when people ask me what is the most important thing in your life it's my family it's not my mentees it's not my research it's not my patients it's not being in the operating room it's not you know making a good income or trying to you know maximize my income or keep it the way it is it is my family, that's the most important thing for me, right? And, 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 and uh, you know, they're being good persons and, and they're being, you know, honest and they're being, you know, successful to, to the degree that they can be successful, right? It's not like I'm expecting they're going to be, you know, incredible or no notable individuals. No, what, 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 what they can do to the maximum of their potential, that is the most important thing because the day I become old and I'm retired, I think that will be my most strong legacy. And, and this, and this may also sound like a notion of being sort of a romantic notion or a 19th century or old century notion. But I think this also is true amongst Latinos, right? We care, we care about our family. It's not just about me, right? It's, you know, I got a family and I feel responsible for my family and, uh, that, at least for me, I think that's the most important. All right, well, we're gonna turn that over to Dr. Molina because I think he has a couple of little things to follow up with you on. This is great, excellent. Thank you so much uh, for all those questions from the audience. Uh, so and thank you for all the attendees. So Dr. Fernandez, um, I'm not sure if you ever watched Inside the Actor's Studio, but um, James Lipton would always end with a list of questions. These are rapid fire. So the first one is, what is your favorite word? Well, in the operating room, my favorite word is echo. You know, <laughs> and that's actually not even a Spanish word, right? It's, it's an Italian word that, that I don't know why it's stuck. In, in, in Spanish, we use the word, in Mexico, we use the word ecole. Ecole, you know, it's like, you know, like something is really going well. So when things are moving very well and you're in a state of flow and the resident is just doing things just right, you know, echo is a word that, you know, makes me happy. It, and that I say a lot. That's that's probably my favorite word. What is your least favorite word? I don't like to swear. <laughs> and, and I actually don't like the residents to swear, you know, a resident that does something wrong and then uses the F word or something, you know, will just, no, no. What sound or noise do you love? I, I love I love music, I love classical music. I also love, you know, sort of popular music. But in terms of sound, I think the sound of the sea, right? So sitting, you know, just listening to the waves crashing, that is something that suits me tremendously. And uh, what sound or noise do you hate? Ah, <laughs> uh, you know, I, <laughs> it's interesting. I have sort of this even visceral reaction, even to this day, you know, I remember as an intern, we had to do the amputations. 
And the sound of the saw against the bone is just something that, that gives me to this day sort of a visceral reaction of almost repulsion, right? Uh, and uh, I think I, I, I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> what about the operating room do you like the most? I like, um, I like order. I like a clean dissection. I like a clean exposure. I like a, a scrub tank that is really efficient, you know, that, you know, gives you things efficiently in a nice way. Uh, you know, that's, that's, I, I like the operating room. It, it is a little bit about control. I like, you know, you have all the variables that are controlled and I enjoy that. What about the operating room do you like the least? Okay, turnover times that are excessive, right? Where, where I'm just you know, pulling my hair because it's been two hours and they can't, they can't start the next case. That, that. Is there one thing you do every day? If so, what is that? I, I think it's very useful at the end of the day to do a little reflection, right? To do a little examination, you know. Uh, you can ask yourself very briefly, it doesn't take much time, you know, what went well? What didn't go well? And what could I have done better, right? I think, you know, it's a little bit of a sort of a spiritual dimension. You know, you're doing an examination, you know, whether you're, you know, you're, you're a person of faith or not. I, don't, I think asking yourself those questions, that has nothing to do with faith. Of course, if you're a faith, yeah, you want to be better for whatever you want to do. But I think that I do that. I do that pretty much every day, you know, and uh, it's a little bit of a habit. What other profession besides being a surgeon would you like to attempt? I, I love nature. I, I think if somebody says, look, you can't be a doctor, you can't be a surgeon, uh, and, and you know, you, you can do whatever you want. I would have liked to, to become like a landscape architect, for example. I would have made me very happy, very creative. Yeah. What profession would you like not to do? Ooh. I, I honestly could not have been a dentist. And I'm not, I don't mean bad for dentists, but that's just like, yeah, I would not have done that. And this is the last question. What would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Uh, welcome. <laughs> so I hope I can make it, right? <laughs> There's no conditions attached, right? Welcome, you know, and I, yes, yes. I think, I think we're all called to, you know, do the best that we can. And we're all called to be kind to other people. And, and I think, you know, live sort of a, you know, I don't want to say a righteous life, but sort of a, you know, a virtuous life. And try not to hurt others or, or do bad things. Thank you so much. I, I'll pass it on back to Dr. Reyna. So thank you so much for taking the time to do this. And thank you for joining us. Um, really the biggest thanks for being our inaugural Latino surgeon from inside the operating room series. Through the general support of Massachusetts General Hospitals Center for Diversity and Inclusion, we would like to give you a small gift to show our appreciation for your participation in this inaugural event. I'm gonna pretend I'm handing it to you, but you have it already. Well, I, I, I got a beautiful gift that I got yesterday that says, the Latino Surgical Society presented to Dr. Carlos Fernandez del Castillo in recognition of your support for the LSS as the inaugural speaker of the Inside the Operating Room series. May you always continue to cultivate, nurture, and support the advancement of Latinx surgeons. August 13, 2020. So it's, it's a very nice plaque and I'm gonna have it very proudly in my office. And I am very happy that this organization exists. I encourage you all to, uh, to help others who are starting and to be good mentors. And, and uh, let's hope that 10 years from now, we, we see those curves of attrition and they say, look, the attrition is no different than it is for, for others. And uh, if we do that, that'll be terrific. This was a lot of fun, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for all of you who are attending and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for this really special event. Good night, everyone. <laughs>